healthcare providers. Keep an eye out for one of the most common causes of serious liver injury in the world. This common anti-tuberculosis drug can cause minor liver injury in up to 10-20% to of patients, major injury in 1% of patients, and fatalities in 0.1% of patients. I'm talking about isoniazid. These numbers may not seem like much, but if everyone reported by the World Health Organization infected with tuberculosis in 2012 were able to take the medication, up to 1.7 million people would have had minor liver injury, 86,000 would have had major injury, and 8,600 people would have died. We're going to talk to Dr. Freeman on presentation, diagnosis, and mechanism of isoniazid-induced liver disease. Then we will discuss treatment options and monitoring with Pharmacist William. Today's special on SIUE Pharmacy News. Good afternoon, I'm Julia. And I'm Kushbu. thank you for joining us today. In light of recent events, we're investigating the drug isoniazid, one of the main drugs used to treat tuberculosis. The incidence of isoniazid-associated hepatitis is lowest in patients younger than 20 years of age and greatest in daily alcohol users in patients 35 and older. The manufacturer states that progressive liver damage may occur in up to 2.3% of patients older than 50. Some studies suggest it may be more. Drug-induced liver disease has replaced viral hepatitis as the most apparent cause of acute liver failure. Now we are live with Dr. Freeman. He's a physician with over 15 years of experience in the field of medicine and currently works at Gotham General. Dr. Freeman, can you tell us how long does it take for a patient who is on isoniazid to present with isoniazid-induced hepatotoxicity? Well, most cases of, of isoniazid-induced uh, hepatitis occur within the first two to three months, although cases can present as late as 14 months after therapy. So how would the patient with isoniazid-induced hepatotoxicity present with? The onset is insidious and resembles acute viral hepatitis. The clinical features include fatigue, weakness or fever exceeding three days, nausea, vomiting, unexplained abdominal pain, jaundice, and dark urine. Most symptoms appear days to weeks before onset of jaundice, which is usually the presenting feature in 10% of cases. Isoniazid-induced hepatitis can be brief or may progress with development of severe liver failure and massive hepatocellular necrosis. The latter cases may be associated with ascites, edema, and encephalopathy. So if the patient presents with all the symptoms that you just described, what is the procedure of definitive diagnosis? Well, diagnosis can be difficult, but it essentially relies on two deciding factors. Serum transaminase levels are used in the diagnosis. According to the American Thoracic Society, serum transaminase levels should be either, one, more than three times the upper normal limit with jaundice and or hepatitis, or two, more than five times the upper normal limit regardless of symptoms. If other causes of elevated levels are ruled out, isoniazid can be re-challenged. If this is done, a twofold increase in serum aminotransferase that falls after discontinuation is the strongest indication for diagnosis. So how does isoniazid cause liver injury? Well, unfortunately, the exact mechanism is not completely understood. As you can see, isoniazid has two possible routes of metabolism. In the primary pathway, shown on the left of the figure, N-acetyltransferase acetylates isoniazid to the intermediate acetyl isoniazid. Acetyl isoniazid is then hydrolyzed to acetylhydrazine and non-toxic isonicotinic acid. Further oxidation by cytochrome P450 to acetylhydrazine causes free acetyl radicals that covalently bind to liver macromolecules and lead to hepatocellular necrosis. In the secondary pathway, shown on the right, cytochrome P450 oxidizes isoniazid to the toxic metabolite hydrazine. Hydrazine can be metabolized to ammonia and free radicals and cause induction of cytochrome P2E1, leading to more toxic metabolites. It seems like isoniazid has lots of potential to cause liver damage. Who is at most risk of developing isoniazid-induced liver toxicity? Well, this type of liver, liver injury occurs most often in patients receiving a four-drug regimen within the first two months of intensive therapy. Risk factors include older age, alcohol use, cirrhosis, Asian race, malnutrition, and underlying chronic hepatitis. In addition, some individuals may be slow acetylators, 
which could increase risk of injury. Slow acetylators have reduced metabolism of isoniazid, allowing more toxic metabolites to accumulate. Now we're here with Dr. Williams. She is a pharmacist that has been practicing at Gotham General for over five years. She worked with Dr. Freeman on the treatment of this case. After diagnosis of liver damage, what did you do? Well, unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot we can do after diagnosis. The management of isoniazid-induced hepatotoxicity largely consists of removal of the isoniazid and supportive care. In more severe cases, liver transplantation may be needed. Since there isn't much we can do for treatment, alternative treatments are currently being studied. The use of N-acetylcysteine is being studied during therapy to protect the liver from damage by increasing liver blood flow and possibly binding to toxic metabolites. Camphorol and mannitol are currently being studied in mice as adjuvants for preventing CYP2E1 mediated hepatotoxicity induced by isoniazid. So what type of monitoring should be practiced to decrease the incidence of isoniazid induced liver injury? There can be a lot of potential monitoring with this drug. Monitoring includes a monthly clinical evaluation including a brief physical exam to assess for developing adverse events. Baseline serum, AST, ALT, and bilirubin should be obtained, especially in high-risk patients. For example, those with history of liver disease, alcohol use, or older adults with several disease states. Routine periodic monitoring every three to six months to obtain blood work is recommended for every patient. So Dr. Williams, is there any advice you'd give patients taking isoniazid? Yes, I would recommend stopping this medication if they experience any nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, or fatigue. If they experience these, they should contact their doctor for further evaluation as soon as possible. Patients should also be aware of the possible interactions and risks of taking over-the-counter medications, alcohol, and alternative medications with this drug. They should not start any new medications without first consulting their doctor or pharmacist. So in summary, isoniazid-induced hepatotoxicity can be serious. If your patient is at high risk, taking isoniazid and has any of the stated symptoms, have them contact their doctor to determine if they are experiencing this disease. Thank you for staying with us through this special on SIUE Pharmacy News. Stay classy, SIUE!